Sorry about that, folks. Uh, just had it on auto DJ. But good evening and welcome to Raconteurs News. It's Thursday evening. It's the 9th of June. We're nearly at Midsummer's Day already. And uh, we've got a great show. We've got a great evening lined up for you. For you because uh, nine o'clock we've got Doc Rock who's a, along with Dr. Rock's radio show, uh, always a brilliant show. But tonight's a pretty special one because it's um, his report back from the Fire in the Mountain Festival, which he unfortunately couldn't get to broadcast live last week due to technical issues. Um, but as always, I'm joined by Jason Holmes. Good evening, Jason. Good evening, Andy. Um, thank you for not sacking me. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, we, we'll not be having any of that. How can I sack you? You ain't got a job. But, <laughs> but uh, no, it's been an interesting week so far. Um, looking forward to speaking to our guest tonight. So I suppose without further ado, we'd better introduce him. It's uh, Paul Webster. Good evening, Paul. Evening, guys. Everybody Good evening, Paul. Yeah, I'm great, thank you. Smashing. So, uh, tell us what you've been up to. Well, well, I mean, we I can't rehash over some of the old stuff for anybody who's still not uh, looked into uh, utility bills and bills of exchange and warrants. <clears throat> but the main aspect of what I started off with was my property, mm-hmm. and obviously when we went through all the other bits where. I actually had read about stuff and I thought, I can go to court, represent myself and tell them that I just don't wish to sell my property. I don't care what she does with hers. She could have sold her half to you, Jason, or you, Andy. I wouldn't have had a leg to stand on, but that's the law. Mm-hmm. I'd have had to negotiate with you two as to what to do with the property or to how we're going to live there because I'm not selling. Nobody has authority. I knew that. But when I walked into that county court and I asked that first question, what jurisdiction is a judge standing under, then I'm surrounded by armed response police. And I'm stood in the courtroom saying, I don't want to sell my property with two armed police in front of me, two behind me and one either side of me. That's my first introduction to what's going on in these county courts. And it goes so deep, but the, the scam is so simple. But as we were just saying before, Jason, when you've got an ignorant mass of people who haven't got a clue about the information that you're that they're talking about, you can you can run a mock as much as you like. Now, the fact of the matter is, when the basics of this is, as a reasonable man in law, as a reasonable man, a man goes into a bank and says, "Can I borrow a hundred thousand pounds?" and the bank says. Yes, we can lend you that money. So, as a reasonable man, on a fair agreement, the bank transfers from an account, or basically what the bank's doing is putting £100,000 of their own money on the table. Right, there's the £100,000, that's our security. What are you putting up as security? Well, I'll put this house up as security, so if I can't pay you back these terms and conditions, you can then sell my property to make sure that you get compensated. Is that a fair agreement? Can we all agree on that? Yeah, absolutely. Right. Now, the party that you're going to borrow the money off is not actually lending you anything, so they are putting no liability or security on the table. They are going to facilitate your worth, your credit. They're going to monetize £100,000 of what you're worth. So... When they monetize that, are they lending you anything? No, they are creating from a service money. So basically, in my understanding of it, is that you, the, the only thing that you owe the bank is a service fee for the facilitation of credit. So they, in my reckoning, they're not charging you for the fee at the start of the mortgage. They're tagging it on to the end of the 25 years and they're charging you interest on the fee but you haven't paid them to actually monetize your credit. So, right, is, is, is this somewhat similar to, I think John Harris were talking somewhat like this, weren't he, um, a, a few years ago? I've, I've never heard John Harris talk about mortgages. I've heard him talk about the free man stuff. This is not free man. Mm-hmm. No, no. Yeah. This is basic commerce. This is butter, bread and butter basic commerce. So 
when you sign your terms and conditions, nobody that I know, apart from people who I know now after the fact, has ever read their terms and conditions. There's a power of attorney in the terms and conditions. So you're actually giving the bank or building society um, power of attorney to execute a document in your name. We now know that the execution of that document is the securitization and the sale of your mortgage. Now, as your trustee, they're actually there to look after you at the bank. And they're meant to reduce your liability by selling this. So let's, for argument's sake, you've been, I mean, speech marks, borrowed a £100,000. They securitize your mortgage and sell it. Let's call it for 90000 Now, you only owe yourself £10,000, but they don't tell you that. So the £90,000 that they just sold the mortgage for goes straight into their coffers. Now they control the interest rates of your mortgage. All of a sudden, you're in a position where you default three times. When you've defaulted three times, under the European Parliamentary Directives, the bank has to take insurance out in case you default. You pay, you pay the insurance through your interest. Yeah. Now, when you defaulted, the bank claim on the insurance for the full amount. So now the bank have just been given £190,000 from the sale of the mortgage and then the claim on the insurance. Then you get to the point where you've defaulted, you've claimed on the insurance, now we're foreclosing. Now we're taking your bricks and mortar property and we're going to sell it again. Let's say they get the £100,000 for the property. That's £290,000 for a £400 plus VAT service fee. So they've made three hundred grand from putting no liability up, no security. You own all liability, yet the insurance policy is not paying out. Why is the insurance not taking the hit? Why is the banks not taking the hit when they're not lending the money? Where's the fraud going here? It's not staying with the banks. It's not staying with the insurances. It's not staying with the judiciary. You've got to start looking higher up the chain. But the basic fact of it is they've written things in a certain way and hidden things in certain acts that, thank God, people are finding now and people are taking this forward. I said to Andy, I'd love to be able to put more meat on the bones of this, but I can't, because we're using stuff in our cases, I can't, I can't divulge everything, but the, the remedies are there in their own acts and statutes. Mm-hmm. Fortunately, we've got people who have been helping us with, um, we've made so many connections. I can't, I, honestly, mate, I can't tell you in the past year how much this has gone on in leaps and bounds, not only with mortgages, uh, the utilities, it, it, it's, it's virtually self-explanatory for the utility bills. The economy's bankrupt. Every time you pay the bill, you're actually stopping that bankruptcy. It can't fulfill itself. So we're not even told any of that. I've got, I know, I'm in touch with people who are actually using accepted for value and getting results with it. It's all about perseverance. I'm all for people going and just doing something. Yeah. I know people who fell flat in the faces with the utility bills. People who have actually got an understanding of it, but they won't go into court. Why won't they go into court? Because we're, we always lose. Well, if nobody goes into these places and shows how bad it is, then the people on the outside, you cannot scream at people, there's no system, it's all been foreclosed on on the UCC filings. There is no system, stop paying into it. People don't know anything but the system. So am I just meant to look after myself and do all that or challenge a few things? Because I'm not I'm not brave art. You know, I, I've picked and cho- chosen my fights. I was taking on the property, I was taking on the bank, I was taking on ju- uh, judges and solicitors. Ridiculous amounts of corruption that was going on. And then British Gas just decided they were going to try something as well. So I challenged them on that. And after ending up before a district judge, nobody uh, bothered turning up. All warrants were thrown out, and now they won't hear any more warrant apps. So the only way to prove their claim is take me to a court of equity. I'm more than willing to go, but they're not going to go there, so I would have to become claimant. And that's what we're being told 
in the Royal Courts now by the Masters. We're being told that if you you want to win any of this, you've got to become claimant. Because mm-hmm. as a defendant, acts and statutes are written in a certain way. And if you do not find the correct body of words, they can ignore everything you say. I put case law that Anthony Carlin created in 2013. I put uh, Carlin News versus Santander. Now, there's a, a lot more to it, but the basics of it is that, yes, you are Santander, but you've still got to prove to me this man owes you money. I'm not going to take your word for it. Yet my judge picked the case law up, turned it over and said, I can't see that. I take the bank's word that you owe them money. Yeah. So and they do that all the time, don't they, as well? They don't they don't require any evidence. It's because the judges the judges are untouchable because of the way the acts have been written and where it has been hidden. If you don't find them, the judges can sit there and laugh their balls off at you. Case law proving that they've still got to prove the claim. No, I've got this, I'm sat on top of this, you're not talking about this, so I'm safe. And they're selecting these judges to take, participate in these cases. Anthony Carlin uh, took it to a certain point, and they've ended up jailing him. Now, they didn't jail him for anything other than contempt, but he'd got enough information to make a, an arrest of that judge for on fraud. Any ordinary man in the street, if a policeman had got that kind of information, he would have been arrested with no issues. Just, just to yeah. clarify there, Paul, Anthony Carlin, that's the, the guy who was a, a Northern Ireland police officer who actually arrested the judge and then that's got jailed correct. for contempt, yeah. That's correct. And he, he's, um, I've spoken to him uh, at length a few times now because, like I said, when I uh, got in touch with him, uh, I congratulated him because he created the case law that I used that was to set up yet another ting up in my case because... When you get so far into this, um, people like the likes of uh, Tom Crawford and Guy Taylor and people like that, everybody point fingers at them and say, look, they lost because of this, because of that, because that. Everybody's fucking losing. Everybody's losing in this. Mm-hmm. They've got to lose because the judiciary and the executive, the executive being the solicitors uh, uh, on behalf of the corporations and banks, mm-hmm. are working hand in hand. Yeah. You cannot you cannot win in Her Majesty's Courts and Tribunal Service because that would mean the Crown could lose in their own court service. That can't be allowed to happen. And because the remedies because we're not we've not got arguments now, we've got remedies to what they're saying. And they're still completely ignoring. And you've got to find out why. It's because we're not using certain words in certain ways. Yeah, when you were talking earlier on, you were talking about um, that you didn't want to sell your property and you had some police come in. Can, can you give us some background to that, that case and, and what, what the reason was you were in court? Uh, yes. Um, me and my ex split up amicably. Mm-hmm. And then uh, she ended up in a situation, not of her own doing, but she ended up in a situation where she was in overdrawn at the bank. Now, I could have sorted that out for her now. And we, we could have been, still been friends and I still had my house, but that's not how things worked out because I didn't understand all this then. So what happened was she rang me on the daughter's 16th birthday. I was about to just drop my daughter off at a bowling party. What, uh, what sort of time, what time scale are we talking about this? This is 20, hang on. This will be 2010. 2010, June, okay. Tw- this is June 2010 that she said that I needed, she needed 500 quid. I said, well, you know that I, I don't have savings. I live hand to mouth. I said, so I said, I haven't got it. And she just said, you'll have to sell your house then. Put the phone down. So that's when I hit the books. I thought, I, I, I can't afford solicitors. I need to research this myself. And it was just so much of a basic, simple understanding that this administrative court has no authority, no power. It must have my consent. How? What ways can I give it consent? If I turn up with a solicitor, I give it consent. So I thought, so, right. Were you, were you co-owner of a house with this, with, with your ex-partner? I gifted her half of my house. She hadn't bought anything. She's not invested in it. But when I said that I pay the mortgage because it comes out of my account, he said, well, that's a joint account. I said, yeah, but she didn't pay any money in it to pay for the mortgage or anything. And all the bills come out of this same account where just my wages go in. And you know what they said? 
she pays for everything and the mortgage because her name's on the account. So even though she physically didn't pay any money in, they said she has got equal right. But I never disputed that. I just said, I don't care what she does with her property. Somebody could have bought her half, and we, we could have had to do a step to and some and bought everything off half in the house, including the sink and the bath. That's yeah. how it would have worked. Because by law, these people have not got the authority to do anything about that. They said I was obliged um, to allow her to, um, what was the word they used? It's not fulfill her interest in the property, but it was to get access to her interest in the property. Well, that is not my responsibility. If she sold that property, which was half of the house, I haven't got a way to stand on. If she'd have found somebody to buy half, I, I didn't care. But I said, I'm not selling. Now, that should have been the end of it, because she should be going away being told, I'm going to have to see if you can find a buyer. But no, they decided to then get bailiffs involved. They decided to get the bank involved, eviction notices, all this kind of stuff. This was early days when I was learning. So, was, so sorry, um, who who was uh, in possession of the property? Me. You, right, okay, you were. Right, we, again, which is another uh, uh, feather in your cap. It, you know, exactly. It's another. exactly. Everything, everything that I did was, even though it doesn't seem to mean anything in the county courts, everything I did was in honour. Because I was showing there's discrepancies here and a court of law must pick up on these discrepancies and allow us to um, flesh them out a bit and say, well, what's going on here? I couldn't get that because straight away, when the police turned up, over the first five hearings, I had over 30 police present, including over 33 coppers that were over five hearings, including armed response, video evidence gatherers and ordinary coppers. This, this was like, I, I know armed blaggers who have been in court and not had armed response police there. What the hell am I doing with armed response police surrounding me and I don't want to sell my house? Are you telling me you're making me sell my house? And that's what they were doing. And it's all paperwork. They all do it through paperwork. And you've got to then allegedly appeal the decision against the judge that's just found against you, a judge that you've just questioned authority over, is this judge going to be uh, unbiased to you? No. So no judge I had, apart from one, was completely unbiased. And this particular judge was, they'd sold, there was three titles to my property. They sold all three under one title. And it was a separate parcel of land that was purchased at a later date. Now, the mortgage property was the bricks and mortar. There was a freehold property that I own solely, which the Brits and Mortar sits on. So those are two titles. And then there was a third title with property at the back of the land. Now that was 50-50. So I claimed half the property back. You haven't sold this because you've only sold it under this title. I've got three titles to this property. Well, they went into panic mode because they'd already sold it. Now I've got clear grab at fraud there. I'd already claimed my right of access to the property because I'm going to work it, I'm going to plant vegetables in it, and all this kind of stuff. So they panicked, and they applied for post-sale authority to sell it. So they'd already sold it, now they're applying to a court for post-sale, so they can get the paperwork tightened up. goes before a circuit judge, because the judge who'd been um, committed, the two judges who'd been committing fraud against me, the main judge was off sick, and I hoped to God I had something to do with that, because I dragged this thing out for five years fighting him. Now, this judge sat down and he started to talk to the solicitor and I thought, I'm being ignored here. He, oh, I'm good. it's happening again. I can't stand this. And I started to get aggravated. And I kept trying to interject. And then on the third time, the judge takes his glasses off his nose, puts them on his desk and says, Mr. Webster, please, I've asked you to wait your turn now on three occasions. You will get your chance to speak. However, Please listen to what I have to say because you may hear something that you want to hear. All of a sudden, my ears have pricked up and gone, well, I've never heard this before. What's, what's coming here? Yep. And he turns to this fella and he, he names him and he, he virtually pulled his pants down right in front of me. He said, Mr. Richardson, are you telling me as a partner of your firm 
you haven't done your due diligence to find out how many titles there were to this property, and you're blaming it on the fact that on the photographs, you couldn't tell there was a boundary. I'm very sorry, but I don't think this court has jurisdiction to award this property to you. Mr. Webster, have you anything to say? I said, yes, sir. I said, I am a man known as Paul about the given name Webster. I require by right restoration of my property. And he pointed at me and looked at the solicitor and said, did you hear what that man just said? Now, that wasn't free man of the land. That was saying, that's my property. What claim have you got over that? Yeah. The judge said, we've no claim over it. I suggest that you walk away because this is this man's property. Now, what they did was they switched it back to the mortgage for the next hearing and got the other judge back in. And they railroaded me because the argument wasn't right. I wasn't using the correct body of words. That's the key to it. You've got to find the correct body of words because we've nailed them into it so much from so many different angles, from so many different people over the last eight years. They are backed into a corner, but they know that they're just going to keep reaming and reaming and reaming the money off until they can't. They're on a, a mission at the moment to just get grab as much cash as they can before it collapses because there's no stopping it. There's no stopping this collapse. It's got to go. And if people think that a mortgage market can't collapse, they just need to go back to 2008 when the American mortgage market collapsed. Mortgage is based on fraud. There is no backing. The banks can't back it because they're lending you nothing. It's based on nothing. It's monetized credit. If you monetize your credit, it's never been in existence before. So if there's a debt attached to that, that money's never been in existence, how are you going to pay that debt off without creating another debt to actually pay that off? And then you talk about borrowing Bank of England notes that they rent to us. So if you ideally, if you've got a £10 note and you owe £10 to somebody, you can swap that promise and they'll accept it. But if you're technically, you cannot pay £10 debt with a £10 note because it's coming with debt attached to it already. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And you can never pay that debt off. The, the basics of how this economy is, seems to work is I promise to, I, I go into a news agent and I promise to pay the news agent for a Mars bar. And the news agent says, I accept your promise. There's your Mars bar. The news agent then goes away to the warehouse and says, I promise to, to pay for your box of Mars bars. And the warehouse says, thank you, we accept your promise, there's your box. The warehouse then goes to the factory and says, we promise to pay you for all your boxes of Mars bars. They go, we accept your promise, there's your boxes. Then the factory turns to the workers and says, we promise to pay you for all your hard work. There's your pieces of paper, we promise you not. And that worker then goes to the shop and promises to pay for a Mars bar. And then the cycle begins again. And that's the economy. So, Paul, has that changed since they altered the wording on the banknotes? Because um, a little while ago it used to say on there, I promised to pay the bearer of demand the sum of X pounds sterling, which is, you know, is, a, is a, an actual physical thing, whereas yeah, now it just now it just says, I promise to pay the bearer on demand the sum of £10, £20, whatever. Exactly. It doesn't say pounds of what, so essentially the the actual the real value of the money is gone. The only the only value of the money is our shoulders. Mm. That's yeah, the only value. Have. That's the only value in this. Like you said, you could go and say, right, there's a ten pound note. I'd like to redeem ten pound of silver, or ten pound of gold. Well, that was when it was backed by something. This isn't backed by anything other than our nature to actually get into an economy and work. If we don't work, there is no economy. And they're more than happy to drag as much money out of us as possible to collapse it. If you look at the state of like Tata Steel, they've just taken a 3% pay cut to keep the job. So they're being held to ransom to keep their job by taking a pay cut. This shouldn't be happening, but that's what is happening. Then you've got stories that the EU are supporting China's steel industry for money we're paying into it. So is it is all this like fear mongering? Is it you just don't know? You've got to be in the game though, and at least looking at it. There's so many people I know. Oh, should we stay in or go out? Well, what do you think? 
Well, I'm not really sure, but what have you read? What have you looked into? Well, nothing really. I just, you know, <laughs> Boris yeah, is saying it's like the to have for, for the team. A lot of people, that's literally how, how, how much notice they take. This is it, but I mean, people who I, I uh, my friends and family and colleagues who I work with, they've gone from not knowing anything to having an understanding at the very least. But it's like one of, one of my friends says he's going to vault in, and I asked him why. The only thing he could come up with was the working time directive. And I went, well, what would be the difference if they come out? Well, they could just make us work anything. I went, so you would accept that then? We come out of Europe, and you would accept that you're going to work 60 hours a week. Would you not have something to say about that? He said, well, yeah, but what can you do? I said, that's the old type of thinking. That's where you, they want you to be. What can we do? You can yeah. do all your hands. You can do everything. We had, God bless her, we had a, a, a girl only in the last couple of two or three weeks who's taken her own life because of a bedroom tax. You know, this, this should not be happening. Over a, a tax that is not only unlawful, not only not enforceable, but at the very least, with no understanding, she can make an offer of what she can afford. Not filling in incomings and outgoings. That's an application to beg for their mercy of what you're going to pay them. You say, give me your account number and sort code. I'll, make some, I'll facilitate payment. And you send them whatever you can afford. I did it with the solicitors. When my, I had a breakdown in 2012 because of all this, because it's very hard to be surrounded by police, knowing that you're right, not thinking, not believing, but knowing that you're right about something, possibly for the first time, 100% in your life. And this, these people are doing this to you. And you're looking round to your family and friends and saying, am I getting something wrong here? No, you're right. You're going to the people who are giving you stuff. Case law, things like this. I'm going, yeah, this works, this fits, boom, we, we've got them. And they're just completely railroaded. So they're actually being given permission. These judges have been uh, highlighted to be able to steal this by legislation because this is virtually legalised fraud. They've written legislation and hidden it. And if you can't find the exact body of words, they are going to carry on with that uh, legislation. And they'll skip around it as much as you like. You've got to, it, you know, we've been getting told that there's a lot of help available for us, believe it or not, in the judicial system. And what we're being told is we're willing to help, but we're not willing to help anybody who's coming in with an argument and spraying it like a music. We want people to come in and know what they're talking about. We've got the correct stuff, and then we can do something. But until we get to that point, and that means somebody becoming claimant, which nobody's done so far, and the ones who have had, they've got so far, and then something has gone wrong, and we couldn't work out what was going on because no matter what argument you want to look at, everybody's got a good argument for the mortgages, but nobody's got the remedy because they've hidden it. So, Paul, um, just remind us what what was what was the eventual outcome of the case that you were talking about that began in two thousand and ten, where you and your um, former partner co-owned a, a house, and there was a I, I think there was a third title as well. What what was the actual outcome at the end? The actual outcome, September twenty fourteen, was the judge that had been committing fraud against me throughout. Uh, the one who decided that case law wasn't applicable, the one who said that, yes, we've heard of SPVs, but I don't believe that this is, this mortgage has been sold in this case to an SPV. The very fact that she knew about SPVs should have been saying, can you provide the true documents? I had a QC there saying, I said, have you brought the original uh, document with my signature on it? And her response was, all original documents are destroyed at land registry. And I said... I'm sorry, what? Are you telling me the only document that pertains to any debt that I allegedly own you has been destroyed? Well, her face ran white. Oh, um, well, because uh, uh, she realised what she'd done. She'd just given me a get-out-of-jail-free card, but did the judge jump on that, being unbiased? No. The judge allowed her to waffle her way out of it and say, well, I don't think that's the case here. Because then she said, I think we probably still have got the original document. I said, well, this letter that you're Bankers sent me, 
said that he was bringing it today. I asked for it. He said, oh, we haven't got it. I said, well, I need to see this. And they weren't interested. They just ran it over. In between, I tried to grab back this property, which I did with the circuit judge. Then it went back before the same judge again. And it was the mortgages. And she dragged me into long grass to see if I could find the body of words. I didn't find the body of words. So they used the trustees of land acts against me. Now, when you, when you look into this stuff, nobody's ever owned the property. We're all trustees of this property. But the fact is, where the scam's getting even worse is when you're going to buy a house, a lot of people, when they're going for mortgages, haven't got a property that they own to be able to put a charge on. So when they're putting this house up as security, they don't even own this property. How can you put a charge on something that you don't own? You can't. So the scam is evident from the get-go. The trouble is with me was I own my property. There was no mortgage on it. It was owned outright. I took a remortgage out on it, and I entered what I thought was a fair agreement. And it's not a fair agreement. When you, when you can show that it's not a fair agreement, then you've got teeth. Oh, have we, uh, have we lost you, Paul? No, mate, no. Oh, right. Sorry, I thought, I thought we'd lost you. No. Oh, um, yeah. It, Listen, I can, t I can talk for two hours, mate, no problem, but I thought it'd be, be better with a bit of interaction. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just thought you'd got I just thought you'd stop sort of mid-sentence. Everybody so, does when I stop talking. <laughs> just, so the outcome was that they... they, they they managed to steal your house? We stole the property because it's all paper. It's all paperwork. The land registry is a paper clearing warehouse. If they, I was told by somebody legally trained at uh, Preston Land Registry that all of it is paperwork, and if they get um, a court document with a court order on it, they follow that court order. No wet signature, no nothing. It's just... It's just like Northampton bullshit warehouse. It's just a paper stamping thing. And I said, I'm not here for um, advice, legal advice from you. I'm here to tell you that this is wrong. And while she was saying, while she was agreeing with me, uh, with her actions, not in her head, she was also saying, I can't help you with that. So she knew what I was talking about, but she also knew that she couldn't do anything about it. And this is where people have got to now start becoming claimant. But in their clever little ways, I think a £40 N244 form, which would start your county court claim, was 40 quid five years ago. I think it's about 150 quid now. And if you lose that first hearing, then you've got to appeal it against the same judge who's found against you. It's not for us. The county court system is not for us. Our remedy is magistrates, is there a case to be heard? Yes, Crown Court jury. That's our remedy. But yeah. if, you're, if you're wanting to engage in the commerce side, because it's fine, everybody who's been answering loads of posts today that people or somebody's been sent down for non payment to council tax, nobody's going to jail for non payment. They're going to jail for contempt. Yeah. That's, what the, the, that's how they're addressing it. You, well, you've not said you're not paying. But you're not making much effort to pay and your argument's crap, so we're just going to send you to jail. So it's well, it's, it's simple, isn't it? If, if, if they say this court ordered you to pay um, a hundred pounds a month and you and you haven't done that, then that's contempt of the court. They can they can they can suggest that that's contempt of court. Exactly. Hearing. Exactly. And that's where people that people get on rightly so, but people jump on a banner and say. You shouldn't go to these courts. You shouldn't do this. You shouldn't do that. They can't do anything if you don't turn up. Well, the fact is, just because, say, I don't turn up at one hearing, that doesn't change anything. So somebody's got to get their hands dirty at some point to show how bad this system is. Um, a lad who's connected to us has had council tax in the high court for nearly five years, and they're just playing around with him, oh, we've not got these documents through yet. They're just, it's all red tape. Because if they actually give him a hearing, council tax is done. Because he's nailed it. He's nailed it on just one of the fundamentals. There's so many arguments now. There's a guy called, I don't know, I think you might know him, Andy, Rob. Rob Bollocks. 
Your mic's off. Your mic's off, Andy. Oh, yeah, sorry, guys. Yeah, I've um, just been meaning to ring Rob this week because uh, he's yeah. not on Skype. Well, Rob, Rob's done a massive amount of work on council tax and mm. he's gone down different avenues about writing it off to the council that it's all this kind of stuff. And he's found out there's like, for his local council that is named as a, a certain council, there's about five or six different sub contractors through it. So you've got different names. Well, what are all these companies doing that they're meant to be just one council? It's not, you know, so he's using that remedy. The remedy we looked into was Section 3 of the Local Government Finance Act, which talks about you living in a dwelling. And it talks about that being a non-domestic property. Now, if I live in a non-domestic property, I live in a business. I live in a commercial property. Mm -hmm. So they're charging me a business tax. And what they base that on is one word called hereditament. Yeah. Hereditament means that the property could have been, is, or could be in the future, a business. And they're going to act on that presumption. So you don't come with the correct body of words that point out that this is a load of bollocks because it's me house where I live. You just presume everything in a private star chamber where you're getting no um, independence at all. It's completely biased. And, so and, these, and, and these, these assumptions that they're making as well, um, that, that, those assumptions stick unless they're challenged. Every presumption that is made, if you do not um, rebut it completely, they'll just keep tapping it. They'll just keep tapping it because the judge can say, yeah, yeah, you're fine with that umbrella. He's not said the right stuff. I'm with you on this one. Because when you go into that room, it's two wolves and a sheep voting what's for dinner. Because there's two parties in there and one's got to be liable. The executive, the Crown, do not want to lose in their own court system. So they get the nice judges who are possibly got uh, Freemason connections, who are going to be committed to a certain other party rather than being unbiased to the public. Now, when you look into it further, like I said, this goes all the way to the top. The corruption doesn't stop with judges and politicians and solicitors. It's all the way to the top this. And when people realise that, maybe they'll stop messing about trying to do solicitors and judges and banks because they're going to wrap you up. They're just mm. going to wrap you up in so much red tape. It just waste your money. Yeah, it's a completely rigged game, isn't it, Paul? Oh, unbelievably so. I mean, there's, there's not even any play in it. Um, with the gas stuff, um, now, I, I've seen people who've tried to get an understanding of it. I've seen people who've taken the bundle I used and added stuff to it. Um, Kevin Mark was one of them. He added um, memorandums from their own, the, the actual utility companies stating that they deal in negotiable instruments, promissory notes and checks. Mm -hmm. So they say, we don't accept that payment. Well, this is a negotiable instrument. But what they're saying is when they say we don't accept that payment, they're pointing to the Consumer Credit Act, Section 123, because they're not liable to, to um, accept negotiable instruments. They're not liable to accept this form of payment, blah, blah, until you get to paragraph 5 that states none of this applies to a non-commercial agreement. So that means under a domestic agreement, you must accept this negotiable instrument because under the bills of exchange, British Gas, who were after me, took up two positions. They took up the cash draw because the payment that they're going to withdraw has been made into that cash count, into the Santander corporate bank. Mm -hmm. They then take up the second position as draw in and take the funds out and then give it in the form of a joint gyro credit check to the payee, which is me. Now, in theory, I'm meant to go to the post office with nothing but my signature national insurance number and accepted for value or accepted without levy for on it. Give it to the post office counter, they scan the check, stamp the check, put the check in the cash drawer, stack the top part of the bill, that's my receipt, my gas account is balanced. That's how it's meant to work. Because we were given shares in these when they claimed bankruptcy and they gave us all the debts, all our ancestors took all the debts on. Now, because the economy is based on the labour, if 
that labour force is concentrating on paying bills, they're not going out and buying anything. So they thought, that's no good to us. How do, how do our friends sell things? Tell you what, let them have the gas, water, electric for nothing. The companies can pay for everything, but we won't tell them. We won't tell them that's how it's set up. Yeah. Why do you think? Why do you think they offer you a fiver to get off paper bills? Go direct debit. Will offer, will not, not your fiver off your bill. It's because they're making money hand over fist. The the jobs of the utility companies are to collect revenue from commercial agreement. A job as your agent, not you being their customer. Their job as your agent is to go. Well, this is a non-commercial agreement. We've got to send in a joint gyro credit. Because to your shop next door, you're getting a statement. You're not going to get a joint gyro credit. You might get a bank gyro, but how do you differentiate the two? One has value, one needs value put into it. Mm -hmm. And with the utility bills, you don't need to put value to it. But I know going back 30 years, my mum, when, when you used to go to when you used to go to a gas board shop or the electric board shop to pay the bills, you'd go yep. into the gas bill, £200 gas bill there, there's £200 cash, and you're handing over a cheque for £200 and £200 cash. They are turning your cheque off, they're calling it a payment slip, and they're putting the cheque and the cash in the drawer. My mum's just paid them £400, £200 out of her own cash, and 200 out of the credit account that was set up because she's got shares and equal shares within the economy of this country. That is the simplicity of it. And it's just been hidden. It's just been taken away bit by bit. And now you've got you've just got people who don't understand any of it a lot of it. A lot of the times. I said to me when I was six years old, I said, Mum, I don't want to get a job. You and my dad work really hard. I'd rather just play on your bike. And she said, you can't do that. I said, why? She said, because when you're older, you'll want to get a house and you'll have bills to pay. And then you'll want to get married. And then you'll want to have kids. And then you'll want a car. You'll want cars as well. And then you'll want to go on holiday. And I said, why? And she said, that's life. And now I said to her, well, well, who told you that? Because there's so much of that life is bullshit. It's been, we've been lied to throughout history. I've been doing a lot of historical research recently. Whole new show, that, but bloody hell, the stuff that you, that's coming up, you just can't get away from the fact that, you know, whoever it is, wherever you want to lay this down, it's not just one organisation, it's not just one man or one set of people. This has been going on for such a long time, and I think it's just that people have started to come together because there's only so much that a man or a woman will take. When you can't get blood out of the stone, what you do, you're going to have to turn your attention somewhere else because those stones are now being thrown. That people have had enough. I see it locally. I see it in the old family and friends. We're not quite there to, ready to do anything just yet, but, you know, the line's being drawn. I think they know that as well as, any, you know, as much as anybody else. They promised us one thing, whether we stay in or come out of Europe, they promised us one thing, and that's financial collapse. The immigrants are going to cause, the migrant crisis is going to cause collapse if we stay in Europe because of all the money that's being thrown at it. Fear mongering, you might, it might just be. Mm. But if we stay out of Europe, if we come out of Europe, rather than remain in Europe, um, we're going to face financial collapse because we can't trade. Yet we've got legal agreements that we can trade with anybody, whoever the fuck we like. Who are we going to listen to? If, somebody, if my next door neighbour says, hey, I don't want to sell your car to that fellow across the road, I want to buy it. If I decide to sell it to a lad across the road and trade with him, who's going to are, stop are you, Sorry, Paul, uh, are you genuinely seeing people um, turning the tide and turning against this and, and deciding that they've had enough? Are you seeing that in more and more numbers? Well, or, uh, I, I personally, in my everyday life, yes, because these people have gone from my gas bill goes up because you don't pay it to... So how does this really work? Can mm. you tell me again how it really works? I said, well, you're going to have to go and read it for yourself. Yeah, yeah but I want to read it. I need to know this stuff. Somebody was asking me something that I researched so long ago now, and an off-the-cuff comment someone asked me, he says, well, I've heard that the Rothschilds are quite involved in it. I slapped my face with my palm and I went, quite involved. 
says, <laughs> my word, I said, you've done some research. He says, well, yeah, they're cleaners, aren't they? Exactly. So I told him the story about Nathan Rothschild, how he got the information from the Battle of Waterloo and uh, bought the Bank of England in one day by pretending that, you know, there was a panic on the stock exchange. He caused that. And he went, oh, that's very interesting. He says, I'm going to get a book. I says, please do. Please do. Now, this is a lad who wouldn't have said that a year ago. But people are now wanting to learn this stuff. And it's only three people learning and people challenging. People are making mistakes. That's fine. People are allowed to make mistakes. But people are getting punished for not making mistakes. People are getting punished for actually bringing decent arguments that say, listen, we need a good investigation into this, but we're closing you down right from the get-go. You cannot be allowed to challenge these people in their own courts. And the only other way is to go to Europe. And if you've not exhausted the British judicial system and you try and jump straight to Europe, these weasels turn up at Europe crying with their hands clasped, saying, they've not given us a chance to work it through our system. They just jump straight here. You know, we're, we're more than willing to work with them. And then you go back and they fuck you over again. So you've got to, somebody at least has got to exhaust the system and try and get some kind of a landmark or everybody exhausts the system, and then we we just take control back. Because yeah, there's only a certain amount. That it's we, like a self-fulfilling prophecy. The more that they yes. squeeze, put the people yes. on the squeeze, and the more and more that, that people get into debt and they're looking for solutions, and the more and more that there's more people and more and more people uh, try, also trying to find them solutions, and it's, they're having to wait 12 months to get an appointment at the uh, local... Uh, debt centre, people are going to start looking for these um, other ways and other means to get themselves out of the, the pickle that they perceive that they're in. And, uh, but before that, there's a lot of people that are, it's causing a lot of harm to a lot of people as well because yeah. stress and they've actually been suicides over things like this. As I, as I said, we, we lost a lovely girl, bedroom tax. She just couldn't cope with the stress of what they were claiming that she owed them. And she was quite an active member of one of the groups. Um, it's just such a shame because anybody who's doing this over debt, everything can be done over monetary. Everything can be done. I had, um, like I said, my, one of my best friends made me uh, get a solicitor because she knew I was having a breakdown. I didn't at the time, but she insisted on me getting a solicitor involved at one point. And for a 10-minute hearing, it cost me 340 quid. Now, £50 was paid on return, and they said, they wrote to me after they evicted me from my house, and they said, uh, you owe us £290, uh, can you pay in 21 days? So I wrote back to them and said, can you send me your account number and sort code so I can facilitate payment? The next letter I received three days later had their account number and sort code. So from... Um, January 2013, I paid them £10 a month, but I've missed in between because I kept forgetting how much I owe them. So they, they're very nice. If I leave it a month, they always write to me and say, you've not given us a payment this month, Mr. Webster. So they'll tell me how much I owe. Um, February, they told me I owe them a tenner. So I left it in March. They wrote to me in April, said you owe us a fiver. So I left it again. I owed them a fiver, wrote to me at the end of May, I've just paid them two pounds. I'm going to leave it till this month now. I'll let them write to me and tell me that I owe them three quid, and then I'll pay them a pound. They're not going to take me to court while I'm paying them, particularly not seeing as I only owe them three pounds now. But ten pounds a month they were willing to accept rather than try and add costs by taking me to court. Because I'd already had, I, I had these people in... Um, not Jason, because these people were telling me that I was wrong, what I was saying. I went, how can you, how can I be wrong? So eventually, I had half an hour free with the solicitor, who's a, a friend of a friend, and I asked him one question. I said, where does a judge claim authority over me and my property in a county court without my consent? I said, because I really need to know the answer to this, and he didn't know. So he picks his phone up, he dials a four-digit number, so it's somebody in his building. He asked them the same question. And he goes, ah, that's it, right, thank you. And as he puts the phone down, both of us at the same time said, trustees have won that. 
said, yep, that's it. I said, that's an act. I said, how can that be enforced on me if I don't consent that that act is applicable? I said, I am, it's my property. How can that be enforced? He said, I don't understand what you mean. So I reserved this analogy before. I, had, I said, there's a sign on the wall that says a thousand pound fine, no spitting. And there's a copper stud next to it. I spit on the floor and I asked this solicitor, I said, is he going to arrest me? He said, no. I said, why? He says, because it's not an arrestable offence. I said, is he going to find me? He said, yes. He said, how's he going to find me? He said, he's going to request your details. And I said, am I obliged to give him my details if I've not committed a crime? He said, no. I said, so how's he going to find me and who's he going to find? And he slumped back in his chair, Jay. Son, he even said Jay then. Slumped back in his chair, Jay, son, and said, 26 years I've done this job and you just coached me on law. 26 years and I coached him. That is the stupidity that runs through the judiciary. There's plenty who know what we're talking about, but there's plenty who are so indoctrinated that they think this is law because that's their build-up to take common law away. If we stay in Europe, common law goes, everything becomes civil, and these acts and statutes are applicable to me, and they are going to arrest me for not giving my details. That's where we go, especially as going to the Euro, which is just, we, we might as well just hand over all our pastorals now. Just give it all to them. If we're going to stay in Europe, my opinion is, hand everything over to them now, because nothing what they say they're going to fulfil apart from financial collapse, in my opinion. Yeah, and we're pretty close on that. We have been for quite a while. We're, I know our Paul, our financial guy, we uh, tried to have him on a couple of weeks ago, but he got a, um, some sort of something came up anyway, got a prior engagement, and um, he's been spouting this since January. Uh, uh, I think to me, should... it just seems that it, we, t- we seem to have been predicting this um, financial collapse. Uh, and when it happens, I think it's going to be quite a surprise to, to most people, even though we've been predicting it for six years. Well, I, I think I think you're spot on, Jason, but I think one of the things is it's because the the likes of yourselves and Andy are putting this, are giving people platforms to get this information out is the reason why it's not collapsed yet. They, it, they can't make it look so obvious, but it's got to the point where, come on, then you're not even trying anymore. No. You're not even trying to hide the fact that you're stealing all this stuff. You're putting your puppets out in front of us. The likes of Cameron and Boris Johnson, all these other people, and they go, oh, we should stay in, oh, we should leave, oh, no, we should stay in because this, oh, no, we should leave because this. It's a puppet show. Mm. That's the way to do it. Oh, no, it's not. He's behind you. It's rubbish. It's rubbish. If you get through to the fundamentals of the EU, um, uh, I recommend a, a, a good video of Christopher Story did a 20-minute speech on the EU and its origins. Now, even though the EU as, a, um, as an idea and a policy goes back further than uh, Hitler and the Nazis, they took that on. Now, it wasn't to take over Europe. It was to stop a communism engulfing Europe. Now, you don't, you don't hear that from our side of history. You only hear it from a, a different side. But when you start balancing it up, you start saying, well, hang on a minute, there's a few lies being told here. Did Hitler do that because of this? I've got, I've got some questions. Can I ask some questions? No, you can't ask questions. You can't ask questions about this. You can't ask questions about that. Why? If it's true, why does the law need to protect it? Because the truth always comes out, and it's coming out, and it's been coming out, like you said, Jason, so it's been coming out for the last six years. And I think the only reason that they've not done it is because it would have been too blatant. But they'll do it when they're ready. They believe they've got everything in hand. It just depends on where you're, you're at as, as an individual man and a woman, I think. I think if you're caught between the two worlds, if you like, if you're caught between what the bullshit they're talking about and your own spirituality what feels right to you if you're basing it all on material stuff then i think you're coming from the wrong place mm. and i think you're just going to go with whatever they go with but there's so many people been bitch slapped awake myself included when i took that crack 10 years eight years ago well no six years ago in the property but i started to look into it 
um, around about 2008, 2009, I started to research different things. But when it's actually in your own back garden, and they're saying, we're taking this property, and you go through everything, say, you can't. You go into a courtroom and confidently say, you can't do this. Why is our response police stood around there? You know, it's a, it's a bloody shell shot, that. And it's, it just goes to show um, the, the, the magnitude of the fraud that they're committing and what, they're willing, what resources they're willing to use to stop you finding that out. You know, it, it's not too far away from you being racist or anti-Semitic or something, that some label that is thrown at people. You know, you're giving some evidence. This is factual evidence. Why is it racist? Why is it anti-Semitic? Why is this? Why is that? You can't ask these questions. Yeah, it's, it's, it's like, like a control, control group. group. That, that, that's that's like all it is. Religion. That's all it is. And then when you've got the control rid of money, because as uh, Mayor Rothschild said, give me control of the nation's money supply, I don't care who makes it to mm. So you've got the money control. You've got a health control. Well, what else do you need? You've got a fear factor now. You know, once upon a time it was easier to kill a million people, but it's so much easier to control them these days yeah. because yeah. people control each other. People patrol each other. You can't say that, why? Because that's you can't say that. Well, why can't I say that? Mm. Well, an absolute perfect example of, of self-policing is the smoking ban in pubs, isn't it? You go in a pub, and if you stood there and lit a cigarette up you'd have everybody in the pub virtually turning on you, saying, you can't do that, you can't do that. You're about yeah. But I've, I've never actually seen anybody in a pub who's actually been arrested for smoking. I know there, there was one or two cases went through to make an example, but um, really, well, these people are just self-policing, aren't they? Exactly, but what they're not telling you is those two examples of people being arrested... What is the first thing they've done? The police have been called. What's the first thing the police are doing? What's your, What's your name? name? Yeah. Can you give us your details? While we sort this out, can you just sign that so that you can say that I've interviewed you? There's your concern. No sign, no fine. People have got to understand that. They need this signature. Mm -hmm. I've had people trying to say, well, I got fined for speeding. I didn't give any details. I didn't even turn up at court. But they put three points on the license and went, well, that's bollocks then, isn't it? Mm. That's because they can't apply this without your participation. Absolutely, Paul. Um, well, I've, just, well, I've just noticed we've sailed through the first hour, mate. So um, what we normally do at this time is uh, play a tune so we can all freshen up, grab a couple if we need to. So I've got one specially lined up for you. It's by our resident rock star, Ken O. Uh, so I'm sure you'd like to have a listen and have a laugh along with this one. So enjoy, folks. We'll be back in about five minutes. Hi, this is Zen Gardner, and you're listening to Raconteur's News. You're listening to raconteursnews.com. Stay tuned for more untwisted, unsweetened news. Please consider buying a T-shirt or making a donation to help support us. Thank you for your support. We do it for us all. Is your number one radio station. Tune in and rip the knob off. And welcome back to Raconteur's News on this Thursday evening um, with myself, co host Jason Holmes, and uh, the amazing Paul Webster. Are you back there, Paul? How are you, mate? Yeah. Yeah, excellent. So, uh, yeah, we've, we've covered the your mortgage, the bills of exchange. Where would you like to go with this second half, mate? I'm happy. I'm happy to go wherever you'd, you'd like to talk about. I mean, I'm, I'm quite up to date with a lot of things that are moving on. Have you got anything to... Well, you, you, was, you was mentioning in the break about health and safety, how um, yeah. it, it's um, a possible means to tackle so many things. And I know uh, we've had Rob, Rob Freeman on, and he's been saying that he's going down that avenue. And you mentioned Rob B earlier, and uh, I, I really would love to get Rob and Rob on together. Could be a bit confusing two Robs, but I think we manage it, don't you? I think to be an ace because I know that Rob Freeman, um, the information he's putting out, alongside the stuff that Rob's putting out, it's it's multi-angled attacks. You know that's why that's why I love 
um, the fact that social media has taken this off. Don't get me wrong. You obviously have got people out there putting bad information out. You've got people who are making mistakes and they're getting berated. But you've got to look at the bigger picture of what is. You know, the fact is that nobody... I could put a 1,000 people in a room and ask that 1,000 people, did they think that politics, the judiciary, um, the police, um, the banking system is all corrupt? Everybody put their hands up and agree, but it's what we're going to do about that. Uh, going to the health and safety stuff, um, especially with people who are, who are workers, the health and safety is, um, I think it's the silver bullet. People, as far as I'm concerned, um, unions have lost their teeth. They've had their teeth pulled a long time ago. Unions are, uh, I would say, from certainly a certain point upwards, are government. They're operating in trade union law that is written by the law society, not written for the man and woman. It's written for the, the to make sure that the crown does not lose any more revenue than they need to. So that's, this is why you've got unions who are going and negotiating health and safety. The, the trade, sorry, um, Paul, but the, the, to me, the, the the trade unions have, have been infiltrated and Long have been steered ago. along uh, uh, a way. Long time ago, Jason. I, um, I, I had the, I, it didn't affect me as fortunately as it did uh, uh, family and friends, but the miners' strike in the 80s. Yep. Um, mm. was a great um, pointer to where the unions have gone. Um, the fact is they offered loads and loads of overtime um, through the summer and they mined loads and loads of coal and then they decided to take them out on strike for winter. Well, on strike, we've got loads of coal and they just sat there on their hands and let these people starve. We have food banks then. We've got yep. food banks now. We haven't progressed. So why people think, because we're actually... In the EEC then, and we're still a part of Europe, Europe then, what is going to change? Nothing is going to change. People have got to make their own change. But, you know, it, it's meant to get down to the barbaric stages of pitchforks at dawn. Turn up with your pitchforks at Westminster and come on, lads. Girls, get the fuck out of there. It's time for a complete change. Where else do you go with it? I can't... Um, I can't accept the lesser of two evils now. I've decided whatever my fate is, is my fate. You know, uh, uh, if I can get through this to something better, not only for my uh, children, but for other people's friends and families who I know that are damned hard workers, do you know what I mean? And they're, they're pointing fingers at people, at immigrants, and look at these, this is because of them. And all you're arguing with these people that are coming over from a place that's being stripped clean and they're being offered free money and free housing. You're not telling me you wouldn't take your family to that place. Exactly. But I know I would. No, I know you... I would, but they're being invited over here so they cause argument between us and we're looking down at the floor, on the same floor worse than them, arguing with these people and the bastards at the top are just stealing everything. Yeah, I mean, I, I um, where we live in Boston on the east coast of England, um, there's a massive, massive amount of immigration take, taken place since the early 90s. The population of the town has apparently increased sixfold. Same in my town, that as well. But, but there's, there's no increase in the infrastructure. I think they've built one new school in all that time. The hospital's still exactly the same size as it was. I think there's maybe a, a ward being built on for something different. But uh, they haven't increased it to cope. And, of course, all the locals who used to work in their seasonal jobs, harvesting the um, vegetables in the field, yeah. they can't get a job now because um, quite a lot of these migrants uh, work for minimum wage or less, where these guys, they used to work through the summer months, seasonal, and they work from 4 in the morning till maybe 11, and they'd earn a brilliant day's wage. And... You know, they could live off that throughout the year. They could go on holidays whenever they wanted. Now, yeah. they've got a pot to piss in, and they're blaming the migrants. Yet those oh. very same people will say to me when I tell them that I was, as a teenager, I lived in Switzerland for work, and, uh, uh, you know, when I was about 40, I had a bar out in Benidorm, 
They was like, oh, brilliant. Well done, mate. Trying to better your life. I said, well, what do you think these people are doing that are coming here? They're doing exactly what I'm doing, yet you're slapping me on the back for it, and you're calling them everything from a pig to a dog for doing it. You're not blaming the right people. Exactly. And <clears throat> like I was saying, you're left arguing with migrants when one, one, of, the, one of the arguments that a friend said to me, well, we should stay in Europe because of this as well. I said, what, is, what do you mean by this? And he said, well, they subsidise our farmers. I went, yeah, they do. Do you know what that means? They pay <laughs> our farmers to not grow anything. That's what they do. So that is why people can't go and pick vegetables, because the farmers are getting paid to not grow. They're getting subsidies to not grow. Now, what if they start subsidising people for, oh, let's say steelworks, oh, let's say coal? All of a sudden, oh, we can't afford this. We could ship it over to China, where somebody will do a 70-hour week for seven pence an hour. We really don't want to keep paying these idiots. And the European Union, with our government, are actually helping to fund that, to transfer it. They're easing the transfer over to another country, taking manufacturing capabilities from this country. What does that leave us with? It leaves us with a country full of people with degrees, PhDs, who are stacking fucking shelves at Asda. Yeah. And that is, yeah. that is by design. That is completely and utterly by design. You cannot read the policies of these people and come to any other conclusion. Because if you claim to have read these policies and you still want to stay in Europe, Jesus H, I wouldn't <laughs> I don't know where you'd go with that. And, and plus I think I think there's also the, the, the one of the major arguments, uh, the two major arguments on um, this US, uh, this EU referendum. Our immigration is one and uh, economy is the other one. Now, only 17% of our exports actually go to the EU, 17%. And we'd still be able to export to them afterwards if, if we left the EU, um, just the same way as we did before we were in the EU, before the EU even, you know, existed. Well, the, the only thing that I, the only possible thing that could put my finger on that's wrong with that, Jason, is, yeah, we only export 17%, but how much do we actually export these days? We don't seem to manufacture very much. You know, you've just had a... There's a, a place up at ours, near, near to me, and they're building a new lift bridge. It's called the Barton Lift Bridge. It's up near Manchester. And it collapsed because the steel wasn't structurally sound. Where have they imported that from? Because it's not British steel that they've used. So you, you, you were, were the people saying we only export 17%? Well, that sounds very minimal. But when they're promoting it on the other side, they might only be saying we're only exporting 20% anyway. We yeah, need to yeah, find uh, out sorry. what it is. I just, to make, I, just I just want to make the point that, 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 that uh, the whole of our exports isn't manufacturing. And, and I think manufacturing now is probably a minority of our exports. I mean, when you're talking about exporting things, I'm talking about exporting rights to football and things, things like that, things that we export to other countries. You know, that we, do, that we, because really we don't build anything, we don't um, that, engineer anything anymore. That's so the, the the only thing that we export is the stuff that we that that well, we seem to be good at, which is uh, sort of football and entertainment and that, and that sort of thing. Tax so avoidance. So basically, basically, we export shite that's backed by nothing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's what they've reduced us to because we they've stripped us of everything, and we've got to we've got to stop that because if we go into Europe, that's not going to stop. That's that's just, if, if anybody thinks that voting to stay in Europe will stop our crisis that we are entering right now, we've been entering for five or six years. It's going to happen. People don't think that the mortgage market can collapse. People think that the mortgage market is the strongest market that there could be because nobody does not pay their mortgage. Everybody pays the mortgage. But that's all it is based on, is a, a man and woman's promise to pay it. That's the only thing that keeps it afloat. 
because it's backed by nothing. Because the money was never in existence, so therefore it's backed by nothing. You've got nothing to fall back on. So when they collapse it, they'll just go, oh, we'll have to take your house. Well, if you don't know what they've done, you're just going to let your house go. Mm. And I know people who've took extra mortgages out right now and extensions and stuff they've had to. Yeah, I know um, I'm, lo I'm looking forward to uh, next Tuesday because uh, we've got Lisa Tanner who's coming on to join us and she's going to be talking about the um, investigation she's done into securitization of mortgages. Oh, brilliant. I'll listen to that. And you can find out uh, where to go to find out if your mortgage is being securitized, which most of them have, and also to find out what it's worth and what the, what they're doing with the money. So uh, I'm really looking forward to speaking to Lisa again. She does some pretty amazing research. I'm looking forward to listening to that myself. Yeah. But it, but it's exactly right. The only mortgages that aren't being sold are people who have already got the fingers in pies. All those underlings, all those idiots, all our mortgages are sold. Mm. A dozen times, half a dozen times, who knows? There's one guy in South Africa actually traced his mortgage to Malaysia. His mortgage had been sold seven times, and he found the mortgage owner was actually in Malaysia. So now you only make you only your your liability is only reduced on the first transaction. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't matter after that. But the first transaction could because it's the the most that you're going to get because. When, you're, when the second transaction comes, say, like I said before, your 100 grand your, is securitized and sold, yeah. you might make 90, which would reduce your liability to just £10,000. Now, if you knew everything about the ins and outs of your trust account and what value it is to you, could you just write that 10 grand off? Of course you should. Mm -hmm. It's a current account, it's a savings account. That's all they're running for you. But then... Whoever's bought that mortgage for 90 grand will sell it on again. You might make 80 grand off it. And it goes down and down and down until it gets to people. It's a bit like the debt recovery store. The first people that come in are paying top whack for the debt if it's a decent debt. When you get down to the people who are paying £100 for a 10 grand debt, you know you've got the dogs after you. But <laughs> everybody in between has made money. Be it pence or pounds, everybody in between has made money. And that's all this is. Remember the trickle-down thing? That's how the trickle-down thing works. It's not trickling down to help us. It trickles down through their friends and companies and pals who've all got subcontracts through the crown to have all these utilities at their beck and call. People think, oh, yeah, but our gas, water, and electric were privatised. Yes, they were, but it was the running off that was privatised, not the... Um, not the grid that's ours it cannot be taken away from us without our consent have we consented to anything we stay in Europe we've consented to everything yeah yeah the, sorry the great thing about this Paul is um, and the great thing about the information that you're giving us at the moment and which is absolutely fantastic is that it's all common sense really isn't it it's all common sense if someone says, if we're governed by consent, then you, you need, if somebody wants to enforce an act or a statute on you, then let show me where I gave you consent. Exactly. But that's the basics of it. Why, my, one of my bumpers is I used to get a free local paper. It's not free anymore, so I don't get it. Yeah. It used to have who's in court this week. In, invariably, I'd, I'd always read it because I'm bound to know someone. <laughs> I always knew someone who'd been in court. Yeah. Anyway, out of about 14 people who were in court, 11 were to do with £200 fines for cigarette ends. Now, if you walk down the street and you throw a cigarette end on a bit of rubbish, I'm going to think, what a tramp. You're a tramp. I wouldn't do that. I would make sure I put that somewhere I should be putting it. Yeah. Yet, people are being stopped by a clown in a costume who has no authority, and they're saying, what's your name? And people are still going, oh, it's such a thing. It's John Smith. I live here. Can you sign that? Yeah. What are you doing? Your signature is payment. Your signature is worth more than anything that you could ever understand. Your signature paid for your bleeding house. You've now created a liability for yourself. Boom. 
And it, it's the same with so many of these things. I mean, um, we often oh, talk about the, then. You, all the videos dropped. <laughs> oh no, we're all right. It, it's the same with, um, for example, TV licensing, which we often talk oh, about. Oh. You know, they come to the door. The first thing they say, "What's your name?" <laughs> and you say, "What's yours?" And I, I had this with a guy on the doorstep. He says, uh, "Doorstep." He says. Um, Oh, first first visit. I'm from TV licensing. What's your name? I said, uh, sorry, don't answer questions. And he just said bye and walked off. And then uh, he came back again, and he 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 didn't introduce himself. He just said, I need to know, are you blah blah? And I said, what's it got to do with you? Who are you? He said, I just need to know. And he he got quite stroppy. And I just said, look. I told you last time you came, we don't answer questions, shut the door, and he walked off. I was... Um, and now I'm getting li- letters addressed to the legal occupier. Oh, I, I get that. Listen, I've been under not just an investigation, but I've been under a full investigation since January 7th by TV licensing. Oh, yeah. Now, September 2014, 14th of September 2014, I can tell you that day because... Uh, the court hearing I was about to leave the house to go to was the one where they turned the case law over. Oh, yeah. And as I opened my door, as I opened the front door, I'm talking to my mate behind me who's coming to court with me. And as I opened the front door, I turned and there's a fella stood in front of me with a badge on and glasses. And he says, uh, are you the tenant? I said, who are you, mate? He said, oh, I can always speak to the tenant. I said, have you read me sign? He went, that's all you had to say, pal, and walked off. That was TV licensing. And I haven't heard from him or them ever since, apart from legal occupier. And, and what? Yeah, I, I had a similar situation. I, I had a, somebody knock on the door and uh, I, I, he knocked on the door and I opened the door and he said, uh, TV licensing. And I went, uh, OK. And he said, uh, you, th- this house is not licensed. I said, I don't need a license. And he said, well, why do you not need a license? And I said, well, I don't need a license for the same reason that I'm not going to, that I don't want to pay somebody to stand a paedophile to stand in the corner of my living room telling me lies. You know, <laughs> it's the same thing. I, I wouldn't pay a paedophile to stand in the corner of the room telling me lies, so I don't need a TV licence. Well, well, see, my, my aspect is it was so easier for me because I turned the TV off ten years ago. I'm not, I don't watch television. My computer is hooked up to my 50-inch monitor in my living room. I don't watch TV at all. I in fact, it makes me want to spew when I see it because sometimes you get to see bits of it at work. And they talk about it at work like, ooh, don't pay, we'll take away. What are you going to do about that then, Webby? I said, well, the basics of it is what they don't tell you is that every person that they actually go in and take away from has actually gone to court, admitted the debt, and then they've reneged on a payment plan. I said, that gives them jurisdiction. That's why I call Baylor to doing this. I said, you get a debt recovery coming around saying, uh, are you such a thing? No, fuck off. Oh, 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 well, I need to speak to... It doesn't matter. Get off my property. You know, I've had people say, you can't remove people's implied rights of access. Jason, if you come to my house and I say, don't you come back here again or smash your face in, have I removed your implied right to come to my house? Yeah, I think you might have. I, I, think, I've, I think I've hinted at it. Yeah. So, if, if they come with a legal, because I've had people say, I'm legally obliged to come. No, if you if you claim I owe you something through legal, go to the court, summons me and prove your claim. Otherwise, sling it, because this is private property. You don't come back here. Get them off the property. That's all I've ever done. I've had to, I've only ever, I've never even had to escort anybody off my property. The gas man, he told me he was breaking in. Now, this was before I'd even uh, stopped the warrants. I'd ignored the first application. He turned up at my house. I comes around the corner coming from work. I put a lad inside the house to make sure nobody broke in. I'm coming home from my dinner. I get this phone call. They're here now. I said, I'm only 10 minutes away. I'll be there. Turns around into my street. There's three police cars, six coppers, a warrants officer, a locksmith, and a gas man. So the street is full. All the, all the front, I had to park like three houses down because the street was full. And I'm walking up. And Let's I just say, up, I don't think your village needed an idiot that day. <laughs> well, they got several. They got several idiots that day. 
But one was the policeman, and bless him, he stayed for two hours asking me questions off the record because he was interested in mortgages and stuff. But he puts his hands on this black jacket on the police stand, mm. and he says, uh, before I could speak, he just went, you're going to have to let him in, mate, he's got a warrant. And I just said, are you, are you here as peacekeeper or bailiff today? He went, oh, we're just here to keep the peace. He said, then your opinion's not warranted in this matter. He never spoke again. I turned to the warrants officer, I said, <laughs> this is my private property. There is no problem with the safety of this supply. This is a monetary dispute. It is in dispute. If you put foot on my property and try and get an entry, the copper stood right next to me. I said, I will remove you by any means necessary. The copper's never said anything. He never put foot on my property. After 25 minutes of phone calls, they all went, apart from this copper who stayed to ask questions. And he just wanted to know what was going on. I said, well, you need to know that this is coming. I said, you've already, you, you think that your pensions aren't going to be touched yet because the police didn't have the pensions touched at that point. Now the police know that the pensions are gone. The fire service know the pensions are gone. Prison service know the pensions are gone. NHS, gone. Yet they could all turn this around with health and safety issues. Fire service, health and safety issues. Police service, health and safety issues. Prison service, health and safety issues. NHS, health and safety issues. But if you're going through unions, you're going to negotiate your health and safety. My health and safety is not negotiable. Uh -huh. Yeah. It's, uh, it, like I say, it's, uh, it, it's a game and it's uh, a, a lot of people are still falling for it. And until we uh, educate people to not fall for it, and to not give the details. If you're a, just because somebody's wearing a, a, a <laughs> costume, why, why do you need to answer the questions? It's madness, isn't it? It's yeah. madness. I, I said to, I, I even you, I told this story today actually. I said, look, there was a lad uh, from one of the Nottingham groups, and this was police camera action. He was pulled over in his white van, refused yep. to give details, no tax and insurance, refused to give details, wouldn't get out of his van, no comment, and my feet to go, wouldn't listen. All of a sudden, the policeman smells alcohol. So they rag him out of his van and arrest him and take him to the police station. And they stand him before the desk sergeant. What's your name? No comment. Where do you live? No comment. Have you been drinking this evening? No comment. Put him in the cell for 16 hours. They bring the judge to him. And outside his cell, he's heard to say, has he given any details? No. Has he said anything? No. Release him. And at the end, the police camera actually says... The white van man was related, released without charge. No mm. tax and no insurance. Why was he released without charge with no tax and insurance? Mm. Who are they going to find? Who are they going to do? They can't tell him who he is. There's people getting speeding fines through. Well, they've got my car. There's a photograph. I said, can they see who the driver is? Well, no, it's the back end of the car. It's just... I said, right. So they need to know who the driver is. They can't find the... Uh, owner and they can't find the keeper so they want you to grasp the driver up whereas you should be saying can you tell me who the driver is and I'll pass the details on to him to pay his fine well they can't tell you who the driver is so what are you doing why are you interacting with these people mm -hmm. you mentioned a while back Paul about the notice that you had on your door you said to the TV last have you read the notice on my door um, yeah. can you tell us what the word in is on that notice because I'm sure people would find that really useful. Um, well, it's basically it, you can find them the ten a penny over the internet. They're all worded differently to what you actually want. Some people are putting signs up. If you knock on this door, it's ten pounds for the first ten minutes, and then it's twenty pounds for every five minutes after that. Mm -hmm. You agree to this when you knock on the door, which will stop some people knocking on the door, I suppose. Especially as this is getting more and more. Um, well known but mine is just a removal of implied rights of access if you put in if you google removal of implied rights of access what you're saying is if you've anything that is coming through an administrative court anything to do with civil anything civil you do not come to my house notice to print, uh, agent is notice to principal and vice versa you take it to court should you come to this property after me removing this, you will be fined £5,000. Not the company, you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And 
nobody, the individuals. That's nobody, the way to do it. Exactly. Nobody can say you can't do that because that is possible. People don't necessarily do it, but nobody's come back to my property. I've not had to take anybody to court. But the only way we're going to start to win is to become claimant. The fortunate thing with me and my mortgage stuff and the property, um, the same uh, judges in the same county court robbed uh, another mate of mine's property. This guy has free access to the justice system. So we go as joint applicants, not as a, um, a, what do they call it, a class action, as a joint applicant because class action, you could have 100 people and the person who's losing it loses, everybody loses. Whereas as a joint applicant, you've got your both, both arguments there. Same judges, same county court, but not going after the judges in county court because that's wasting our time. There's bigger fish. There's bigger fridge. <laughs> We know where to cast the line now. And, you know, I, I can't wait to actually... I've, I've got to speak to some other people to actually get this information out there. And then hopefully we can get the remedy sorted. Yeah, yeah. I think as well, a, a lot of people do sort of go straight for the judge or go, you know, that, that's made the... the um, signed a warrant or whatever, the, the loan lawful warrant, and, and perhaps they might go for somebody high up, but if you start going for the ones that are turning up at your door rather than the companies, the people that are, are actually doing the them. job, that's the, they're the ones that you've got, they're the ones that you really need to get because once they break down, and, and let's face it, they're not really being paid that much for what they're doing, and once once it becomes intolerable for them, then well, the whole system breaks down. Look at it this way, Jason. Imagine that one man or woman takes a policeman to book over Section 26 of the Criminal Justice and Courts Act 2015. That section tells you what the police are allowed to do. If they go beyond their powers, they're facing seven years custodial, seven to 14 in some cases. Yeah, 14 Um, maximum, isn't it? Yeah, I've I've got two going in. Exactly. Uh, Well, this is what I'm saying. People have not become the claimant to actually action that yet. You, you've got to in. Now, we had a guy down in Sussex, Ovo, which I hadn't heard of that utility company up until two, two, three years ago, but it's down south. Ovo turned up with a warrant that said along the lines of in the area of the local justice and what court it was. Now, in the area of, where was that? Was that the car park? Was that a toilet? Were we don't know because it's a rubber stamped warrant, but that's a statutory warrant. You can't say these utility companies haven't got a warrant to fit page go meter. That's bollocks. Of course they've got a warrant to fit page go meter. They're legally qualified to do that, but they need your consent to fit a page go meter. Without your consent, they're not fitting it. So the other warrant is a forced entry warrant. Now what I'm telling people to do is now is take the, I did this with my mate, unfortunately he felt a bit let down because nobody turned up before a district judge with British Gas again, so another, yeah, his, another warrant is thrown out. But I told him to take the Gas Act, which is about 127 page document, copy and paste it into Word and type in the search bar, rights of entry. Find the sections that have, give them a right of entry. Now, there's no point arguing the 54 Rights of Entry Act. Have this gas company got a right to enter your property? Yes, they have. If you're on holiday and somebody smells gas, you want some bastard to break into your house and stop that gas leak. Yeah. So they have got a right. But it's only under certain sections. There's about five of them. And they pertain to pipes, fittings, escape of gas. Nothing to do with monetary disputes. So they're applying... People think they're applying for two warrants. They've already got the stats to you one. They're legally qualified. Don't argue that. Just tell them you don't require the you don't require a page one meter. But what I did, seemingly what was different to other people, was I'd already put the accounts into disputes. I'd already invited them to come and check the supply. But then my gas agent stood in the dock and said, 
this isn't a health and safety issue. We check the supply when we read the meter. This is a monetary dispute. I went, right, so there is no forced entry warrant application that's applicable here. We're in the wrong jurisdiction. So the legal clerk said, I can't go through this in uh, 10 minutes, Mr. Webb, so I'm going to have to adjourn it for a, a district judge. At that point, one of the magistrates, a woman, said, uh, Mr. Webster, have you got um, a bank statement that shows uh, so much was in your bank account and so much left it to pay British gas to balance this? And I said, no. I said, it's in the bundle there that I've settled it through the bills of exchange. And she put her glasses on the end of her nose and said, bills of exchange? And before I could answer, the legal clerk turned around and looked up at him and said, yes, ma'am, that's a civil remedy we don't deal with in this jurisdiction. As soon as he said remedy, I went, boom, there's teeth in this, there's teeth in this. They're not going to let me win it, but I knew there was teeth in it. And when I got to the point where it went before a district judge and a guy in a boiler suit turned up for the first hearing and the judge looked at him and said, I'm going to presume that you're not legally trained. No, I'm <laughs> not. Oh. Right, Mr. Webster, if we give... If this is given to the legal team, I'm going to adjourn it for 56 days. 28 days for them to respond to your uh, documents, and then 28 days for you to respond. I said, that's fine, I'm happy with that. Because the letter that this guy turned up with was a letter that I got from British Gas about three months previous, and the basics of it was... Um, we've all, we all know about these debt avoidance techniques gleaned from the internet and promissory notes. I haven't promised to pay because under a non-commercial uh, non agreement, I can't promise to pay. There's no need for me to not promise. There's no need for me to pay because I'm being given payment to just balance it. There's my check. There's my argument. That's the route I went. Other people have done A for V. Other people have challenged different ways. But I got the joint gyro credit check. If Andy, if I owe you 100 quid, am I going to give you a check for 100 quid to pay me back? Mm, you wouldn't normally do that, no. Yeah, that would be stupid, wouldn't it? Yeah, of course it would. Andy, you owe me 100 quid, there's a check. You owe me 100 quid now. Yeah. The first thing you're going to do is if I've handed you a check saying that I, you owe me 100 quid, you're going to go, oh, Jesus, here, have your check back. I don't want it. Mm -hmm. So that's what they did with me. They sent me a check saying, you owe us this, man. Well, I can't do it at the post office. The bank won't cash it. I'll transfer the cheque back to you. Can you deal with this? We don't accept that form of payment. They're committing fraud because it's their cheque that's bouncing like a ball. I can't get access to the funds. They're holding me in dishonour through their actions. Now, you can't explain that to the company because you're talking to a man who talk to me, dog. Do you know what I mean? No disrespect, but these people are trained in rhetoric and not in remedies and solutions. Then you try and speak to the legal team, and you're blocked off from them. And the last time I rang uh, Staines Middlesex, which is Centrica's headquarters in Run British Gas, I asked to speak to the legal team. They wouldn't put me through, but they'd speak to them and ask me to ring back. Fifteen minutes later, I rang back and said, yes, Mr. Webster, they're reviewing your account as we speak. They'll be in touch. That was July 2014. I've heard nothing. I got a, a red letter two days ago, and they've sent me a check attached to the red letter. But it's, you must get in touch with us urgently. Mm. Otherwise, we may send somebody around to speak to you on your doorstep, and we'll have 36 quid. What's that going to do? If you turn up, if you turn up at the doorstep, you're going to get told where to go. It's not going to go anywhere. I, I chose to ignore them because they were ignoring me. I did everything I could to balance my account, to show honour and prove that I'm not liable. They ran away. I've not paid for my gas for five years. That's not by an accident. Something with the paperwork was right and something what I did was right because there's three of us that has used the exact same bundle, the exact same argument in the same context. And all three of us got to the same place, yet other people have taken the bundle added bits to it and been railroaded. Is it because adding bits to it gave them too much room to play in? We don't know. Because all we know is that they're being told now, we went to a 10-minute warranty hearing that we dragged out for an hour and three quarters, and an hour and a quarter of that, the judge went out deliberating. Right. 
So I'm going to grab both warrants to fit page of all means to buy force if necessary. And I stood for the police. Gallery and said, that's a farce. That's fraud. You can't force entry for a moment of history. You must understand what you're getting involved in. So you shuffle the paperwork and that didn't speak to anybody. And that's what you're up against. So it's not people, it's not people failing. It's not people not understanding. It's people who are understanding, but they are failing because they can't let us win. And people have got to find, at least find a happy medium with that. They're being trained in the wrong way, aren't they? They're being yeah. trained in the way to get the result rather than to resolve the issue. They can't resolve the issue. That's the point. That, yeah. So, so all the all the training is how to get the result, and the result is you paying up. Yeah. Fraud. How can oh, how yeah. can we how can we make this man liable? Come on, us two are against him. How are we going to uh, collaborate to? To prove this, now we've got the case law that shows that there's collaboration. Why do you think now all of a sudden the judiciary are backing away from their own legislation of joint enterprise? Joint enterprise was brought in. I don't know if you recall, there was a guy who was kicked to death in Warrington. Yeah, yeah, I remember. Um, yeah. He, he was his missus fought valiantly and got case law brought through for joint enterprise. So. A guy that was stood there whilst this guy was having his head stamped on was as guilty as the guy who was stamped on his head. That's what Joint Enterprise was saying. Yep. Now we've started to bring Joint Enterprise. Oh, no, no, it's, uh, it doesn't mean that. So uh, we better repeal this. We better hide that section and we better do this. They're panicking like mad because we've got them on everything. And I don't just mean me and the group I'm with. I mean... Many, many hundreds of people, thousands of people, are all challenging them from the very, you know, like a parking ticket, right the way to mortgages and council tax. People are challenging on every level. And I've never seen people challenging on this level, Jason. That's why I say there is a, there, there is a line that's been drawn, but it's still going to have to slap a few people in the face and, and put them into the position where... You're going to lose your house, or we're going to charge you this for your, your parking ticket. You know, it's down to the individual at the end of the day. It's 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 all well and good that people can come on a platform like you guys provide, and we can interchange and exchange information. But if nobody ever acts on it, then it's just information. Mm. Uh, fortunately, we've got people who are acting on it, and it, it you know there's nobody who I speak to is actually. Um, passionate about making real changes, nobody ever talks about their own individual stuff, saying, I did this and I did that. The ones who were saying, I did this and I did that, and this is the way to go, are the ones that I usually go, well, listen, I'm going to take some of your information, but I'm going to check it out. I'm not going to follow what you do. Other people say, I followed your methods. I haven't got any methods, guys. I had information, and I acted the way I acted, and the results I got, I stand by. Does that mean somebody else should get the same? Not necessarily so, but two other people who did it the same way with the same bundle, without changing it, has got to the same position. The first and, and, and the, best, to... the best thing, Paul, that, that can happen is that people can report when things... I know this is not really what people want to do, but they can report when things go uh, against them, you know, and, and, and put on, look, this, is, this happened, but... In my, like in my case, I went and I objected to all the documents and uh, I, I, I pretty much put the, 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 the judge on, on uh, notice that if she signed this warrant that it would all, you know, it would all kick off. And then they came around and they, they smashed the way into my house. Now, this, was this for gas? Yep. No, for electric. No. It was British electric, gas, but for electric. See, electric is a statutory warrant. You can't force entry. There's no forced entry for electric. Exactly. If, this is what I'm saying. You're going to electrocute the street. You're going to electrocute the street to death. You could blow the street up, but you're not going to electrocute everybody to death. It's a statutory warrant. The warrants that are being signed, this is why you've got to be careful about what you're arguing. I've had some people say, well, I'm going to go in there next week. I'm going to tell them I've no contract. I went, good, congratulations. You'll have pays you go meet next week. Because... There's no point going arguing no contract. 
if I clean your windows, Jason, for a year, and I give you a bill, and you say, I'm not paying you because I've no contracts, and I take you to court, and the, you say to the judge, I'm not paying him because I've no contracts, the judge is going to say, has he cleaned your windows? Well, yeah. So you've accepted his services. He's cleaned your windows. Pay yeah, 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 but, uh, uh, Paul, I, I went in... And I, uh, what my argument was, uh, it was the wrong jurisdiction, right? So there, there should have been no, um, no, no um, evidence of either whether I'd paid or I'd not paid or anything, because we were in the wrong jurisdiction, and that's what I said, and and it, it was just over overwritten. What she were you saying in the wrong she jurisdiction? Said, over. She said you're right in saying that it's in the wrong jurisdiction, but. Um, uh, you see, I can't, and, and then she started telling me that she couldn't discuss anything about my bill. And then she allowed him to go onto the stand and then said that she was satisfied that I owed this money and, 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 and granted the warrant. That's a fraud. That's exactly, fantastic. which is why I can't get, I, which is why now the police, I can't, I cannot get the, a copy of, I can't get any, the warrant at all. Nothing. There is no warrant. There is no warrant for you to get. There you any documentation in magistrates. There's no documentation in magistrates' courts for these warrants applications. They're a rubber stamping operation. That Mr. Ali, a British gas, told me he has 200 warrants signed off every week. That's what he told me. Yep. And you can come in and say whatever you want to say, Mr. Webster. But I have 200 of these signed off every week. He had 199 signed off that week because it was only me that turned up to contest. Now, when you talk about jurisdiction at magistrates, they've got a legal clerk in front of them. They can flip jurisdiction at any point and deal with a civil matter. The fact is there is no legal clerk that will take on that jurisdictional argument because it's not for him. He can't, if you start to bring out Bills of Exchange Act, Consumer Credit Act, he isn't qualified to interpret those acts because he can have an understanding of that act, and so can you. And you're both correct. Only a judge can differentiate between who is right and who is wrong. That's why my legal clerk put it before a district judge. I'm not having this on my fucking toes. And he put it straight before a district judge. When you're in magistrates, these magistrates now are being told. They don't understand it. They're being told what to do, guided by the legal clerk. Now, you're saying you had a judge in your case. Yeah, yeah. Judge, uh, district judge, judge driver. Yeah, People. so so the district judge has now been brought in. The magistrates have gone because we're winning in magistrates. So now a district judge is now sitting in the magistrate's position. If the judge would have gone in to uh, the civil side of it, you'd have been able to prove the case there and then. However, they don't have to do that because... British Gas have got the claim. So they can they could actually fight against British Gas and award you nothing because you'd have to bring the claim. And that's what I believe now that's where you are at, by the sounds of it, Jason, that you've got to look at this aspect. And if you want a win against these people, you've got to become the claimant. Your arguments, your remedies slightly. Listen, I'm going to win, the, I'm going to win this against these exactly. people. Exactly. Exactly. I am going to win it. I don't care what it takes. Honestly, mate, you've got the argument. It's so simple. It's so, so simple. It, as I said to Andy, they've sent you a cheque and said you owe us this money. What, you, well, what can I do with this? There's your argument. This is a joint gyro credit cheque. It's a cheque of value. It's been sent to me. I can't do anything with it to remedy my account. I'm trying. And these people are now ignoring me, They're harassing me. You know, you're bringing the harassment act. You're bringing the fraud act. All this kind of stuff is building, uh, just setting tin ducks up. Because you get one win, Jason, you're going to retire, mate. You, not only is it, it's like I say to people, if I, if they come to a county court and I win, British Gas versus Webster, nobody's going to pay for gas. Everybody's going to be able to use it. And that's why I get, well, let me know how you get on. Well, sometimes it needs somebody other than me. You know, I've played my bit in this. I've taken the last two years out. I'm just getting back into the game this year. And it's going for more serious stuff. 
because yeah, and it does take its toll on you as well. I, 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 know, you, I know you mentioned earlier on that it, that you you know you had a breakdown in 2012. Yeah. yeah. Um, and and I myself, I, it's yesterday was six months since I had my uh, heart attack. So and that was as a direct. I believe absolutely believe that was as a direct result of that. So, um, you know, it, it, I agree. But but you've just got to do it. It's just something you've got to do. You've just got to take them on. It's when it slaps you in the face, Jason. If it slapped you in the face, I mean, if if a bloke walked up to you on the street and slapped you across the face, you wouldn't go, oh, thanks for that, and walk on, would you? You'd have something no. to say. But these people are slapping you in the face, stealing your property, throwing a few quid back at you like you're a second-hand prostitute or something like that, and expecting you to just get on, get on with your life. It's it's not on. Somebody's got to do something. Would that somebody have been me? I wouldn't. I would have loved somebody else to do it for me. But when people ask you information, I get I get inboxes a lot. How do you do this? What would you do with this? I had somebody say. Could I meet up with you? I'll pay you for your time. I don't want paying for my time. And no, I can't meet up with you to do this for you. I've got my own shit to do. Mm-hmm. And yeah. I'm more than happy to spend, I've spent hours talking to people, giving this information away for nothing. Travel up to Leeds, the gas, water and electric stuff. I've been told I talk bollocks. So I went up to Real Change Leeds and said I'm here to talk bollocks because nobody believes it. Yet nobody will come on and say, this is why I'm wrong. Because nobody can say, this is why I'm wrong. I had one troll, and when my uh, Gas, Water and Electric video went up, uh, Gas, Water and Electric, a free video went up on YouTube, within, I think it was within two days, let's say a week, but within a week, right under my video is a debunking video. And the guy who did it agrees with 97%, I say, and the only thing that he ever argued with me about, I confronted him on it, was... You can't remove the implied rights of access. If I've got if I've got a legal matter to speak to you about, you cannot remove it. I said, that's bullshit. You come to my house with a legal matter and you won't get off my property, I'll fill you in if you will not get off my property. And you tell me I can't do that, because if I filled you in, I guarantee you you're going to think twice about coming back next time. Mm. And I've been polite with you first time, so don't come back. You're not telling me I can't remove that right. You've got a legal problem with me. You go to a court and you go through the proper challenge. You don't turn up at the doorstep and tell me I owe you money because I'm going to smash your face in if you don't get off your property. It's as simple as that. People have got to draw a line and just say, I'm not giving you any details. Why? Because I'm not obliged to. I'm going to phone the police. Here's the police. What are you here for? Well, I'm here to prevent breach of the peace. Right. They're breaching my peace. I'm not advice giving me details, I'm not committing a crime, and you're holding me while I leave. That's it. I've, I've seen people followed by these parking attendants and dog shit patrol attendants phoning the police. And the police turn up and you've just gone, Have you got DNA for that dog poo? Can you prove it to <laughs> my dog? Have you got photographs of my dog shit and me going, Oh dear, not again, I've run out of bags. It's not, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. Learn your rights. I've stop tasted being... that. It's definitely Labrador. <laughs> Just stop being a bunch of pussies because we're, we're brought up to be pussies. We're brought up to stand in queues. We are a nation of queues. You know, we're all very polite. We're very polite. We'll stand in a queue. We're a nation of shoppers. Well, you can't be a consumer forever when your industries have gone and you're not going to be able to employ people. You can't buy things. So then you go into a welfare state, which is going towards a communist state where everything is state-run. Is that not the ploy? Has that not ever happened in history? You want to start slapping yourself away. It's just unbelievable, the scale of it. And only five years ago, this was still conspiracy theory. And you can't get away from it's just conspiracy now. People are taking the theory out of the sentence. Absolutely, it's Paul. there. It's there, right in your face. Absolutely, Paul. Um, as always, the time's flown past. Two hours just whizzes by. 
and particularly when we've got somebody with the passion that, that you've shown tonight. Um, it's always great to have you on board. And when you take the next step, we'd be more than happy to have you back on. You know that, Paul. Just drop There's us a line. We're willing to come on any time, lads. Yeah. And uh, the time is drawing to a close. Um, and we've got Doc Rock waiting in the wings to bring you the uh, Fire in the Mountain special tonight. And uh, we're really looking forward to that. Uh, myself and Jason, well, we, also we've got the Cockney Winker with uh, Ken O, the rock star. They'll be on uh, 8 till 11 on Friday night. And I believe that um, after that, Tony's got a mod show lined up because that was requested last time he was on. So um, we're really looking forward to... The week ahead, we've got Lisa Tanner on the 14th, that's Tuesday, as mortgage securitisation. But um, I'd just like to thank you all for listening. As I say... Can, it, can, sorry, can I just say um, sure. genuinely, Paul, one of my favourite guests. If Paul's been one of my favourite guests. Genuinely. Thank you, Jason. I appreciate that. I'll, I really do. Yeah, and me too as well. Uh, always a pleasure to have you on, Paul. Um, I'd like to thank the listeners for listening because without you guys, we'd be just talking to ourselves. So um, get ready for some uh, straw raising from the dock and uh, we'll be back on Tuesday and uh, we'll play you out with a little song. Thanks, boys. Take care. Thanks, Paul. Good night, everyone. Good night, Jason. Good night.